um, with that, I just I'm thrilled to introduce our um, final speakers of the year who are um, representing a working group on plant reproduction. So today you'll be hearing from um, Dr. Jeline Montagna, and she is an associate professor at DePaul University. Um, Jeline is a population ecologist with really broad interests um, spanning multiple species. So research on patterns and drivers of spatial temporal synchrony among and within populations with a focus on mass seeding, which I think you will hear about today, um, macro systems biology and global change biology. Um, and uh, we will also be hearing from oh, all three co-PIs on this synthesis working group. So Dr. Miranda Redmond, who's an assistant professor at Colorado State University. And Dr. Redmond's research covers also a breadth of topics in forest science and climate change. Um, she's interested in environmental drivers of tree demography, Again, seed production, which hopefully we'll hear about today, and recruitment, growth, and survival, um, causes and consequences of forest disturbances and tree population adaptation, as well as ecological forecasting. Um, and Dr. Redmond co-develops research as well with partners and stakeholders to identify strategies to enhance um, both forest and woodland resilience. Um, and to address uh, management objectives, really diverse management objectives. And the final co-PI on um, this project is Dr. Elizabeth Crone, who's a professor of biology at Tufts University. And Dr. Crone studies plant animal interactions and works at the intersection of theoretical ecology and natural history. Her current projects include studying the causes and consequences of mass seeding, effects of mass seeding on the plant's consumers, determining the effects of climate and land use change on butterfly populations and bumblebee demography. So really broad um, research looking at the consequences of different kinds and forms of variance on plant population dynamics. So we're thrilled to have um, you Kofi eyes of this working group and I'm just gonna stop talking and turn it over to you. Uh, attendees, if you have any technical issues or questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. And again, use the Q&A liberally and a lot, and we'll have a, a vibrant discussion after the um, seminar. Jeline? Great. 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 Thanks, Jen. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. So we're going to be talking and, and introducing our, um, our synthesis working group on plant reproductive drivers. And the long title is there as well. So of course we're a synthesis group um, and therefore we wanted to start with acknowledging the contributions of LTR sites and investigators that are, that are collecting invaluable data um, without which we, we couldn't do this, this synthesis work. Um, also the National Science Foundation and NCS, and of course our, our fellow working group members. So one of the really interesting things is this phenomenon of seed production in perennial plants that is oddly and weirdly highly variable. So they don't have the same amount of seed production every year. For many species, there's this like big booms and busts. And the relationships between these drivers of variability and reproduction are still quite poorly understood. Mass seeding is sort of in general, this phenomenon that's defined as the synchronous and highly variable seed production by a population of perennial plants. And so here's a, a bunch of data um, on the x-axis. It goes from 1988, this time series, up to 2016. And this is mean cones per tree in, in white spruce. And you'll see that there's these occasional periods of time and in individual years where there's this large seed crop or what we call a mass seeding event. But on average, you know, reproduction tends to be low in most years. But during these high reproductive events, the tops of trees can just be covered in these reproductive structures. In this case, it's going to be cones, so much so that we can actually detect these sometimes using satellite imagery. This phenomenon of mass seeding is common in a variety of different perennial plant species. So acorn productions on oaks follows this highly variable and synchronous pattern, cone production on conifers, and even perennial tussock grasses. Uh, for instance, these in, in New Zealand have been uh, quite well studied as well. And there are hypotheses for why plants would have this highly variable and synchronous reproductive pattern. And some of these are, are you know, maybe there's evolutionary reasons for this. Um, one reason could be seed predator satiation. So for instance, if 
a seed predator population, or if a, if a plant population just produced the same amount of seeds year after year after year, you know, the, the animal populations that are predating on those seeds would just increase their carrying capacity to consume all the seeds. So uh, uh, a strategy to avoid that would be most years produce very few seeds, and then every once in a while produce an enormous seed crop while those seed predator populations are low. And many of these seed predators could be birds or small mammals and insects and others. Or pollination efficiency is another hypothesis. So if the female and male reproductive structures are all produced at the same time, then there'll be sort of more bang for your buck in, in higher seed quality and germination following those events. And of course, there's uh, the role of, of proximate weather cues um, as well. So temperature and precipitation have been shown to, to play some important roles. However, while I said masting is this highly variable synchronous thing, there's a lot of variation that exists across different populations and species. And so uh, using a global mass seeding database, what this is showing is on the x-axis, it's the coefficient of variation of seed set. Elizabeth is going to talk more about that later, but this is a measurement of variability. And so the higher the CV, the more variable it is. So some species or some of these data sets are highly variable and anything that's you know, much less than one is not very variable at all. Um, so these are for some global data sets. And then when we look at species averages, we still see this enormous amount of variation. And there's variation within species as well that Miranda's gonna talk about later on. So why might we care about masting? Well, you know, it's this interesting phenomenon that's cool to study, but also there's these cascading effects. And one of them that's quite well known is um, particularly up in the Northeastern US, you have this oak mast production that then increases populations of white-footed mice and chipmunks, so small mammals and deer. Then you get more ticks. Oh, and then there's more incidences of Lyme disease. So we might care about masting for that. Um, and then there's also some conservation implications of masting in some areas as well. So this is an example from New Zealand. So beech trees produce mast, which increases house mice and stoats. Um, oh yeah, those aren't native species to New Zealand. Um, and stoats are predators of their native birds and bats. So there's conservation implications. And, you know, maybe we care about climate change. So the drivers include temperature and precipitation. And these patterns are, of plant reproduction are sensitive to these, but we don't really have a good grasp on what the implications of climate change are. In part, because most of the time series are quite short in length. Um, and, and so we have, you know, mostly correlative analyses so far. So. Historical studies tend to be conducted on only one or a few species and only at one or a few sites. But these long-term data are really important because it'll give us you know, more confidence in are we characterizing the patterns um, appropriately because these you know, high reproductive events maybe only occur every once in a while. And so that gets to the second point that there's a relationship that exists when your time series are short with the coefficient of variation. So that data are not very reliable. So you need to have long-term data in order to um, address some of these questions. And long-term data allow us to ask questions about change over time. So, you know, this is where the LTR network synthesis uh, comes in. So our objective is to synthesize data that are collected at a number of these different LTR sites by different groups. Um, to identify the patterns and drivers of plant reproduction. And one thing that I think is sort of interesting about our group, and we're actually going to NCs for our first meeting next week, is that 20 years ago, there was an NCs working group looking at the evolutionary causes and ecological, ecological consequences of mass seeding in plants. And, you know, this group produced some foundational papers. And we actually have a working group member in our group that was part of that group 20 years ago. Um, our group, this is the only picture that we have so far, uh, a, better, a better group photo is coming soon because we'll all be together. But so we've only met on Zoom so far. So uh, when Miranda and Elizabeth and I talked about putting this group together, you know, we were, we tried to be very thoughtful um, in making sure that we had a diversity of identities of different individuals and a diversity of career stages of individuals involved. And of course, we would have loved to, for our group to be even bigger, but you know, there are limitations to that. Um, and we look forward to having a better group photo. So our timeline to date, AKA 
doing synthesis work in a global pandemic, you know, it was back in fall 2020, we um, submitted our proposal and then we were funded in early 2021. Um, and we've had, you know, a few online meetings. Uh, some of us have done science communication workshops and the reproducible research workshops that have been excellent. Um, this winter, we've done more online meetings. Uh, and then next week, we're doing our first in-person meeting at NCS, which will actually be hybrid because um, those capabilities exist and not everyone's going to travel. So our first project. So our goal with our first project was something to get us to get all the data together and look at some broad questions that'll then lead to other questions that we'll follow up on on more publications. So our overall objective is to characterize the patterns of mass seeding in LTER data sets. So the rest of our presentation today, I'm gonna to hand it off to Elizabeth here in a second to talk about metrics of masting. Then we're gonna talk about LTER data and then some of the species attributes in masting and the things that we're thinking about um, working on for this project. So I will hand it over to Elizabeth. And you can steal screen sharing if you want. Do you see what is mass seeding anyway? We do, you're good to go. Awesome. Okay, so I, uh, Jillian's been talking so far um, about mass seeding as if it is a thing we know how to quantify. Um, and I think one thing that we know is that it's not a thing we know how to quantify easily. Um, and there have been talks in the past about is mass seeding a special category of seed production or is it a continuum where different kinds of trees and plants are relatively masting or non-masting, or are all is all seed production masting, and we just quantify the traits of masting. So I'm not going to answer those questions for you now, but I'm going to take two time series, which we have pulled from the Kuwita LTER down in uh, the South Carolina, I think, North Carolina, there where South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee all come together, this beautiful Southern hardwood forest to look at them. And they have, I'm gonna show you some data from seed traps of these two LTERs for two contrasting species. The first of these black locust has a time series that is mostly zeros, but with a few years of much higher seed production. The second time series for linden or American basswood, Tilia americana, has a time series of erratic seed production where it sure looks like there's high years and low years, but it's not a lot of zeros in a few intermittent years. And I'm gonna look at some different ways where we might quantify patterns of seed production through time and how they play out on these two species. One of the things we'll be doing in our first paper, well, actually two things we'll be doing in our first product from this working group is bringing all of these time series to light because in spite of those graphs Jillian showed you of lots and lots of studies of mass seeding, I don't believe either of these two time series or the other 20 or 30 or 40 plant species represented at Coweta, for example, are represented in those studies. So we'll be bringing those to light and then we'll be looking at how different features of the time series, metrics of mass seeding, if you will, vary over time. And the most common of these is the coefficient of variation, which is the ratio of the standard deviation to the mean. And there's a typo on this slide. There's been kind of a null expectation in mass seeding that the standard deviation is equal to the mean for reasons we could talk about. Or maybe it is the variance equal to the mean. I don't. OK, anyway, sorry. It's, uh, we'll just keep going. So anyway, it's the ratio of the standard deviation to the mean. And what does it look like for these two time series? Well, for the black locust, the mean is 0 0.00615 seeds per trap. The standard deviation is much higher, 0 0.017. And so the CV is almost three, high relative to the range Jillian showed you. For the linden, um, the mean is uh, 0 0.026. And the standard deviation is 0 0.28. So it's a CV of about one. And so this is a feature um, when you hear Jolene and Miranda talk and a lot of the papers on mass seeding, the coefficient of variation is the most commonly used statistic, but it's high when you have lots of zeros and a few extreme years. Something like this, which has more continuous variation will always have a lower coefficient of variation than something with a lot of zeros and a few high years. So is this what we call mass seeding? Well, maybe to some people, but to other people, they want something that reflects more the variability and less the frequency of non-zero years. So there's something else called the proportional 
uh, variation, which has to do with the ratio of pairwise differences in all the different years in the data and is harder to express mathematically than the simple coefficient of variation, um, which is purported to be less sensitive to zeros. And in fact, if we calculate the proportion of variation, we get a different result where the linden tree is more variable than the black locust, and they're just quantifying variability in different ways. Another feature we might think about in a time series is something called alternate bearing, which is commonly talked about in horticultural tree crops like pistachios and pecans and oranges and apples, where they tend to alternate between years of high and low yield. So the question here would be, do bad years follow good ones? And one way we might quantify this is by what's called the lag one autocorrelation. That's simply the correlation between observations separated by one year. So the correlation between seeds in year T and seeds in year T plus one. And if you look at this scatter plot, you can kind of imagine a negative relationship. But if you calculate the correlation, it's in fact not very strong, although it is negative. When we look at the linden tree, interestingly, we get a more scattered scatter plot, but we get about the same lag one autocorrelation. So if it's negative, there's some tendency for good years to follow bad ones, but of course an autocorrelation like a correlation can be as large as negative one. So these are pretty mild. Another index people have suggested is something called the consecutive disparity ratio, which is just the ratio of observations in successive years rather than the correlation. For that one, we get a slightly higher disparity ratio for the linden than the black locust. The third thing we might wanna quantify about these uh, time series is, is there a tendency for there to be either good years and bad years that are more common than average ones, or so is it bimodal, but you could also think of it as lots of zeros and a few extreme high values. And there's at least two ways to quantify this. The most intuitive to me is to compare two ways of looking at the frequency distribution, and this is easier to see in the lindens, then in the black locust, where we now have the number of seeds per trap on the x-axis, the frequency of years on the y-axis, and what we're fitting is a probability distribution where it's either unimodal, which in this case puts the mode at zero and is the blue line, or bimodal, this is the best fit bimodal curve in red, which has one mode near zero and another mode a little further out. And you can, I'm gonna report a p-value from a likelihood ratio test comparing these two curves, and the red curve is not a significant improvement. So this is not a bimodal time series. Um, for black locust, the red curve actually is a significant improvement over the blue curve because it's picking up these extreme events that wouldn't be picked up by a simple gamma distribution. So this uh, curve with lots of zeros and a few high points is also more likely to be better fit by a two kernel distribution. Um, another thing that, comes up in statistics, I think this might be used more often in psychology and related fields than in ecology, is something called a dip statistic, which is a goodness of fit test of this distribution versus a unimodal distribution. And kind of like CV and PV, you get different results with the dip statistic for these two plants. These are p-values, so they're both much higher than 0.05, but um, the p-value is much higher for this distribution as being unimodal. Then for this distribution, which, well, it's also unimodal, but has a bigger hint of bimodality. Um, only one of the 20 time series I've looked at in exploring things in Kawita comes even close to being bimodal. So what are we gonna do with all these metrics? Well, we could sit around and drink coffee at NCs and talk about which are the things that we want to measure in these time series, and we probably will, but we can also think of them as all different traits that are quantified in different ways. And as we step back to more and more plant species, ask how they co-vary. So do these different features of the time series, or if you want, you could call them metrics of mass seeding, but they're all measuring different things. Um, do they co-vary among species? Are they associated with different taxonomic groups like hardwoods versus conifers? Are they associated with different ecosystems? Well, actually we know this isn't a taxonomic group, but we know that crop plants tend to be alternate bearing, whereas forest trees are more likely to be mass seeding with, seeding with lots of zeros and a few extreme years. Um, but I'm not sure that we'll see that most forest trees have lots of zeros in a few extreme years. Um, 
Are they associated with different ecosystem types? Miranda will talk about some of these things or features or species traits, and she'll tell you what we've compiled. Um, we can also ask, are there distinct syndromes? So do these traits tend to co-vary together where we have lots of species like the black locust with zeros in a few high years, and maybe some more like the linden, which starts to approach alternate bearing, and also the conifer that Jalene showed you at the beginning of this talk. Um, so, and then how does this interact with stationarity, which is a 50 cent word for saying whether or not your value is constant over time. So is there a trend in average seed production? And if there is, do we get different metrics of mass seeding if we first detrend the data? Um, and similarly, are these characteristics changing through time? Definitely in looking at the data, there are time series that are suddenly alternate bearing for 10 years and then not, or vice versa, not for a while, and then suddenly alternating between high and low years. And it's interesting to think about why that might happen to plants. So with that, I believe I will pass it to Miranda to talk more about traits that might predict these patterns of mass seeding. All right, can everyone see my slide? Awesome. So uh, I'm gonna first talk about the LTER, like the suite of LTER data that we will be using for this. And so Elizabeth presented data on two out of 40 of the species at just one of the LTER sites, so of, of just Coeta, um, but we'll really be scaling this up using data from seven LTER sites and we, selected this criteria by finding LTR sites that had reproduction data on woody plant species with at least 10 years of reproduction data because these are masked, you know, because we're wanting to be able to quantify these metrics of masting and need that long time series, as Jolene pointed out. And the data could be visual counts of cones or, or seeds on individual trees or from seed traps distributed throughout the site. And for our first project, we're focusing only on data from the US and only on data from LTR sites. And so here's just a list of those seven sites. We have kind of collated and organized the data from six of those and um, are, have almost wrapped up the, the last one. And these data span a pretty, long time period from about 1960 to 2020, although some time series are substantially shorter than others. Um, but overall, it gives us this kind of broad temporal variability to address these questions. And in total, we have 67 woody plant species with Coeta and the Adirondack LTR sites having the most species among these sites. And the species are mostly located at one site rather than distributed across sites, um, but some species do span multiple sites. And then also not shown here, um, which will tie into what I'll be discussing later, there's multiple populations of like, with different environmental conditions sampled within a site. So there is kind of a bit of environmental variability that we're picking up among these different um, plot sampled. And in terms of the genera, uh, we have kind of the most uh, data available for oaks and fir and pines. And so now I'm gonna hand it back to Jolene uh, for a bit. All right, thanks, Miranda. Yeah, so we're gonna talk about some of the species attributes um, and predictions that we have for masters. So if you wanna to go to the next. So one thing that, so what we've done is we've taken all of the species that we have, so there's 67 different species, and then we've um, looked up information on, on their traits or attributes. And we've just classified these as a species level. So the first one is seed development time. Some of these species of woody plants, so mostly trees, will take two years for the seeds to develop. So from the time when bud differentiation happens to be a reproductive bud or vegetative bud until those seeds are mature is two years and other species it's three years. And some of the data that we have actually aren't at the species level, so we can't classify them. And what we predict is that if it's a species that takes three years to develop, um, that there might be more variable over time with the reproductive patterns because there's more potential sources of seed mortality along the way. 
Another thing that we can look at um, is if it's a needle leaf versus a broad leaf and leaf longevity. Is it? A, can you advance? Okay, yeah. Thanks. Is it not showing up? Did Jalene freeze? I think she must have frozen. Okay. Um, so I will just jump in here. So uh, a couple other things that we look at are uh, kind of needle leaf versus broadleaf and leaf longevity. So we might expect kind of species that allocate uh, annually to substantial leaf growth will have more variable reproduction over time. And then another metric that we're looking at is kind of how these different species are pollinated. So a su substantial amount are wind pollinated and generally wind pollinated species are kind of predicted to have more kind of synchronous and temporal variability um, relative to insect pollinated plants. And then another attribute is that we're assessing is kind of shade tolerance, characterizing it basically on a scale of highly shade tolerant, intermediate, and low shade tolerance. And uh, based on prior research, we are predicting that kind of total reproduction and variation will decrease with more shade tolerance that a species is. And then the uh, additional attribute that we're kind of characterizing all these species by is their mating system. So how many um, monoecious, or whether they're monoecious, um, dioecious, or, uh, or either. And generally, it's predicted that monoecious species will be more tempor temporally variable. Jolene, do you want to jump back in, or should I just keep going? Um, yeah, I, I can jump back in. Okay. Thanks, Miranda. Sorry about the internets. Yeah, so the next one. So the, the last one is um, the is basically seed size. And so our seed sizes really range a lot across our different species with oaks having very large, um, large seeds relative to like these small seeded wind dispersed pines, for example. And uh, we predict kind of higher um, variability with the production of larger seeds that generally kind of require more resources to produce and are often more predated upon. And so then the kind of um, additional attributes that we're looking on for both part of this first paper, but then also kind of really part of a subsequent paper is looking at the species climate zone. And so thinking about whether, uh, and so effectively kind of whether a species is, you know, located, it tends to be located in the hot and dry conditions versus cool and wet versus hot and wet conditions. And so that's one additional attribute that we're looking at at the species level. And part of this really stemmed from um, our, LTE, our LTE, our sites really span a range of environmental conditions. And so the suite of species really vary in their climatic niches. So for example, we have Sevieta in New Mexico where um, seed production has been tracked on Pinion pine and juniper, which are two kind of semi-arid conifer trees, inhabit these really hot and dry locations, generally much like shorter statured trees, not very productive sites. And then we can contrast this with Coita, which uh, is much more of a productive kind of temperate forest, has much more productive temperate forest species such as linden and, and black locust. And then we also have kind of more boreal forest species such as white spruce from Bonanza Creek in Alaska that is able to handle kind of extreme cold conditions and really short growing seasons. 
And so the really core question that we're asked, that we're interested in with this species climate zone attribute is how does masting behavior and seed production response to climate vary in relation to a species climate zone? And so we might expect that species that are found in the same climate zone, so kind of cool and wet species, for example, might respond to the same weather variables for masting. And um, in addition, kind of the coefficient of variation of that inner annual vari variability among a population um, might vary in relation to a species climate zone, given that species growing in more kind of extreme climates tend to have more resource constraints and fewer diversity of species. And so uh, kind of predator satiation may be a more effective strategy in those areas. And part of this um, kind of idea stemmed from some work that Jolene led where you know, she documented really wide variability kind of across um, dominant genera in North America. And one thing that I'm not showing here that she found was that the pinus species that we, that we were examining were generally kind of these, these hotter and sometimes drier species and they tended to respond to clumps to um, climate in an opposite pattern than these other genera that were tended to be located on kind of cooler and or wetter sites. And so, um, yeah, the pine species tended to produce cones during years of cool climate conditions at the time of kind of seed initiation, whereas the other three genera tended to produce cones during years of hot climate conditions at the time of cone initiation. But this kind of question hasn't really been thoroughly explored. And so what our kind of approach for tackling this is we first really need to define a species climate zone, which like initially I think of as being really straightforward, but is actually kind of complicated, or at least we found it complicated. And what we're kind of envisioning or what we've started to do is we've been using the forest inventory analysis data which is a gridded network of plots in forested areas across the US. And there's about one plot every 6,000 acres or so. And we can then get species occurrence data from each of these plots, kind of overlay that with climate data and use that um, information to kind of extract the median kind of climate value in which the species occurred in. So we can look at both kind of the median value in terms of temperature and precipitation. So this is just kind of a conceptual visualization of this where, where each point on this graph might be um, a plot where a given where the species occurred from the FIA data. And then the point in the, the kind of large gray point in the center would be kind of that, um, the kind of what we define as this kind of core or the yeah, median location of where that species is located. And so that species would you know, have a climate zone based off of the temperature at that 50th quantile and that median or precipitation at that 50th quantile. So that's one uh, really key attribute that we have been kind of diving into to see how much it explains masting patterns. And then the additional one is really looking at um, the population, and, the, and this is the final attribute that we're looking at, and it's looking at the population position in climate, safe, climate space. So we're really interested um, at kind of characterizing the climate conditions of each population of which we have time series data for and assessing effectively whether that site is hot and dry versus cool and wet relative to the climate niche of the species. So you could think of it as, you know, perhaps that given site is, you know, a really low elevate, is that kind of the low elevation range margin of that species, or it's at the kind of the hottest and driest edge of that species. How does that influence the variability? So this last metric isn't at the species level, it's at kind of the individual kind of site or population level. And just to kind of illustrate that is here, let's say we have a species of, of 
interest and we have that FIA um, climate data again, we'd be interested rather than kind of the centroid of the climate niche, we'd be really interested in, okay, where is this particular site located in climate space relative to, um, relative to the climate, climate niche of that species? So is it at the hotter edge and drier edge or, um, or at the cooler and wetter edge? And so with this question, what we're really interested is, um, or the question we're really interested in asking in this is how does masking behavior vary in relation to a population's position in climate space? So in other words, are populations or communities at the edge of a species climate space more variable? And our thought is that populations towards kind of the margins of the species climate range will have more variable um, interannual seed production just because uh, they're located in more, um, there's likely more resource constraints there. Um, alternatively, we might expect populations towards one portions of a species climatic niche. So such as uh, perhaps hotter and drier sites uh, will have more variable seed production. And part of this really stemmed from some uh, prior work led by one of my graduate students, Andreas Wyan, where we looked at masting dynamics in pinion pine, so a semi-arid pine tree, and found that, that interannual variability in, in seed production, so that's the coefficient of variation at the population level on the y-axis here. We found that generally sites that were really hot and dry so high, had a high climatic water deficit, that those sites tended to have much greater interannual variability in seed production. And similarly, sites with low summer moisture relief similarly had that high interannual variability. But we might, um, but that was just for one species and one kind of dry conifer. And so we were really interested in scaling this up and how this varies kind of across species, especially those that occupy different climate zones. And um, just going back to that figure uh, that I showed earlier, I think this is particularly interesting given the high variability across, across species and populations in this coefficient of variation. And so for this kind of second um, or this final attribute, the kind of approach we're taking to um, define the population position within the species climate zone. So that yeah, last attribute, we're um, taking two approaches. So one is using species distribution modeling to predict the probability of occurrence at each site. And this will really get at whether that site is within the kind of core or on the periphery of the species climate niche. And then the other additional approach is kind of using um, that same kind of species zone data that, uh, that we'll be pulling from that prior attribute, uh, kind of calculating the climate quantile for each species located at each site. So in other words, if we had, um, so we can kind of visualize this using this uh, kind of mock data from FIA plots of a, a species kind of climate niche, and we could see where that individual site is located. And so in this case, if that was the site, then we'd know that, okay, it's you know right near the 95th quantile in terms of temperature and uh, right at about the 40th quantile or the 20th quantile in terms of precipitation. So um, these kind of two questions, both that get at kind of variation in, uh, in species climate zone and how that might drive masting behavior, um, but also how kind of within a species, uh, what drives kind of within species variability in masting behavior. Those two questions are questions that we'll be kind of starting to get at with the first paper, but will really be a core focus of a subsequent paper where we'll be pulling in additional data sources to have a greater number of population sampled per species.
So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Jolene. Hi. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Sorry. It's 2022 and the internet, whatever. Anyway. Um, so yeah, I think for, you know, when we think about the products that we're going to, to produce, you know, there's going to be the LTR data set where we synthesize all the data on plant reproduction from across different LTR sites together in one place. And, you know, we will make that available and other people can use it and, and yeah, and collaborate. And, and I think that hopefully that'll give rise to other questions of interest. And then of course, there'll be publications and presentations that'll come from this. And, the, and I, we did want to make the point that, you know, with the LTR network, having these long-term data sets that represent these diverse ecosystems and species and the support from the network and the long-term network office and NC support, this really gives a unique opportunity to synthesize relationships between, you know, many things, in our case, the patterns and drivers of variability in, in plant reproduction. And, you know, of course, again, and I started with saying this, I'll bookend it with the end that, you know, this really isn't work that that could, couldn't be, this is work that could not be done without the contributions of many different researchers. And, and we really do appreciate that. And so if you just go to the next slide, Miranda. Um, so then we just wanna again, acknowledge the support of um, the LTR network and all those individuals who've collected data, uh, the National Science Foundation and NCS and our working group members who've been engaged this whole time, again, just online and on Zoom. Um, and I look forward to, to continuing to work with these folks and of course, meeting in person soon. So thank you very much and we can take some questions. Great, thank you so much. Jolene, Miranda, Elizabeth, really appreciate that. Um, okay, so attendees, um, thank you for attending. And I have um, pointed out again, if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A. Um, if you have, if you can't find that, you can use the chat and we'll monitor that as well. I don't see any questions yet, but it usually takes people a minute or two to, to, uh, to find out, find it and, and, and where they're putting in, um, where they should be entering, so. Um, I also forgot to acknowledge my um, colleagues at the LTR Network Office, Marty Downs and Gabe De La Rosa, who are on this, um, this uh, presentation as well. There's Marty, there's Gabe. Um, and Marty, Gabe, if you guys have any questions as well, we can field those while people are figuring out the Q&A. Okay. A perfect seminar. <laughs> perfect. I guess one thing while we're waiting for anyone to put something in the Q and A, I guess I'll just sort of throw this out there. This is a little bit in in the introduction um, that Jen you gave of Elizabeth too. Is you know when we think about masting, there's it's this food source for a variety of consumers that feed on these seeds, and so you know that's one area where I think connecting these data from the LTR network to whatever potential seed consumers are, I think is a really interesting opportunity that, that could be followed up on. Yeah, that, Jolene, that's a really good point. That's something I was thinking of as well in terms of nutrient subsidies to the, to the other populations of the consumers and the effect that that could have both on um, population dynamics of those consumers, but also reproduction in them. There could be some really, really interesting cycles there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, especially comparing sort of mass seeding them to more continual. Um, oh, I don't know. It opens up a whole a whole thing, huh? On diet shifts in the consumers when that pulse of nutrients comes in. Um, yeah, that that would be a really interesting potential cross um, like cross ecosystem study too, or another another whole synthesis group, right? Of yeah, fr from the consumer perspective. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Really cool. Um, thank you for bringing that up. Um, Nick had a question. It's in the Q&A here. I'll read it to you, but you also can see them. Um, you can see it yourself. So have you considered using an inequality coefficient, um, for example, Gini or evenness, et cetera, to quantify the interspecific differences in seeding frequency or magnitude? 
So do you want me to, I, I have a question in response to that question, which is I wasn't sure whether the inequality coefficient was looking across species. And I think now looking at it in the chat, it is for the um, x-axis is something like coefficient of variation and the y of the x-axis being number of seeds and the y-axis being frequency of years. And you could say for each plant species is a Gini coefficient to measure of variation. And I think there's some relationship between the CV and the Gini coefficient, although they're not strictly one-to-one -one related. Um, but looking across species, we haven't gotten to the point of thinking about it in that way. And it's a cool idea. Um, I think that that might be one way. I think a question that will be interesting for us to ask eventually is, and people have asked it before, but I think it's worth asking again, because one of the reasons I picked data from Kawiti, from Kawita is because I went to school in North Carolina, so I thought I'd revisit the Southeast. But another reason is because it has all these hardwood uh, forest trees, and generally studies of mass seeding are biased towards oaks, but then a whole bunch of conifers. And we don't have data from species like the Tilia linden trees or the black locust trees in a lot of these bigger data sets. And I'm not sure if that's because they're less strongly massed seeding, so people don't pay attention to them, or if it's, although that Robinia pseudocacia, that black locust looked pretty strongly masked seeding to me, um, or whether it is, um, although maybe, anyway, one could talk about, we, we also will use these kinds of graphs to do some quality control of the data. And is it one trap under one tree? Um, but anyway, um, but, but then I think a natural next question to ask will be, do we have masting and non-masting species, or is it just a continuum of species where seed production varies in different ways? Um, I haven't seen many seed trees yet that just look like constant seed production. A few. I'm curious, uh, I can't use the Q&A since I'm a host, so I'll just <laughs> pipe up and say it. Um, you. You said that you focused for the first project on uh, LTER data sets. Are you thinking about particular other networks or data sets that you have in mind for future projects? Yeah, so there are a number of, of other data sets that exist, and there have been some efforts to make like a global, a, a global data set that, that recently came out. Um, and so when we started, we, we knew that these other data sets existed and we were like, well, we could do that, but then when do you stop, right? <laughs> and so when we're thinking about, okay, well, what's our, what's our charge of our LTR synthesis working group is to synthesize LTR data. And so at least for now, we've decided we're gonna stick with this. And I think when we go question by question, we might be like, okay, well, if we, Want more data on these particular types of species, then we can go and see what else might be available to supplement. Um, but our goal for sure is to, you know, be focusing. So I think we lost I again. lost her again. I um, think the so end of her sentence is focusing on the LTR data. <laughs> but I will also add that there's an interesting feature of this working group, which is that. Uh, as a course first cut, the LTR sites were set up mostly by community and ecosystem ecologists. And in forest ecology, the tradition was to ignore reproduction and start studying forests once the plants became, you know, waist high little saplings, or maybe call them seedlings, which to a plant, uh, someone who studies herbs means they have cotyledons that are one year old, but to someone who studies forests means they're short and they could be decades old. Um, and so a lot of these seed production data uh, from the LTR network are idiosyncratically collected in the sense that some sites when they put out leaf uh, you know, collection data count seeds and other sites just throw the seeds away. Um, and so for the sites that have been counting seeds to kind of bring these data to life. Um, and I think that's especially true in the Eastern hardwood forests in the West I think the cone counts on conifers have been a little bit more deliberate and organized. In the East, I think a lot of the seed time series data have been collected almost incidentally 
and not much has been done with them with the exception of Jim Clark, um, who, uh, who was one of my professors when I was a grad student in North Carolina, who studied, um, who has been studying mask seeding at Kuwaita, although using much more complicated and less simple metrics than we are. Mm -hmm. So I think that the LTR seed production data are generally underappreciated and haven't been synthesized in a way that all, all of, you know, even synthesized, like put in one place and organized and looked at which of these time series are good and which are one seed trap under one tree and maybe not representative of a population. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I think just bringing the data to light and incorporating them into other people's synthetic databases will mm -hmm. be a bigger contribution than trying to recapitulate the groups that are already trying to synthesize all the right. uh, time series. And I do think that bringing the deciduous hardwood forest data from the Eastern US will um, broaden the scope of available data. In these yeah, I know a few of the Eastern US sites uh, also have forest geoplots. So I don't know whether that's kind of helpful in uh, integrating them. Yeah, thank you for that. Well, we, we are coming to the end, but we have one quick question here and, and from Ingrid, who you will also get to speak with more when you come, when your group comes next week to NCS. But um, you touched on this a bit, but curious to hear more about the relationship between mass seeding patterns and pollinator population dynamics. We talked a little bit there, or mentioned at least nutrient subsidies to consumers, but pollinators. Yeah, that's a really interesting question, Ingrid. Maybe someone wants to give a minute or two answer and then and then we'll wrap up after that just uh, to keep you all on time. Yeah. So should I add, this is my thing, but I've been talking a lot. Okay, so there's two relationships between pollinators and mask seeding. One is that if species are animal pollinated, there might be weaker benefits to mask seeding. So that at least in principle, a specialist animal pollinator can bring pollen from one rare tree species to another rare tree species. And in fact, empirically, we see stronger patterns of alternate bearing or mast seeding in wind pollinated species than animal pollinated species in other data sets. Um, that doesn't mean there's no advantage. If you think about how a bee, for example, actually forages, it's likely to visit more abundant species and it's likely to visit the same species multiple times in a row, so actually transfer pollen when something is more common, more likely. But as a first cut, a wind pollinated species really needs to all be flowering at once, and an animal pollinated species, you can get away with it. So that's one thing. The other thing is that mast seeding, you know, pollinators are not just doing a service to the plants, they're foraging for food. And mast seeding is a food resource for pollinators. And there was a study done in Japan about a decade ago. And I'm not going to remember the first author right now, but looking at the relationship between bumblebee populations and uh, mast years in trees, and you saw a pulse in the pollinators following, following the mast years. And some years ago, I worked on an alternate bearing, alternate year flowering wildflower in uh, Montana and sage scrub, not at an LTE at our site. And we also saw that you could see demographic echoes of these high and low flowering years of this wildflower in the bee populations. Um, so the bumblebees, which have colonies, would kind of respond immediately. Maybe the colony is growing over the season. And the solitary bees, which have only one generation per year, you'd see a pulse the following year, right? Just like a mouse they have, and eating seeds, they have more pollen and therefore higher reproduction. So Ingrid, the relationship works both ways where um, there are some relationships between pollination syndrome and masting, and then the mast is a food resource for things like bees as well. Very cool. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, was that? Oh yeah, that was the question. So I think we're, we're at the top of the hour now, so I would just like to conclude this by um, a virtual round of applause. You can never hear, you can hear us at least. Um, yeah, thank you all so much. And we uh, we really look forward to seeing you in person, at least part of your group in person next week um, at NCS. And yeah, so thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. I look forward to meeting you, many of you next week. Bye.